Hello and welcome to this very uh, unbalanced room. We start to tip this way, uh, we'll get people to move over to this side. Um, thank you all very much for, uh, for coming. Um, I guess, you know, extending a further thanks from Internet New Zealand as far as the day goes, Net Hui, but um, thanks so much for uh, taking time out to pop into this session. So my name is Richard Holstein. I'm from an organisation, a social enterprise, just a wee social enterprise called Digital Journey. We're based in Christchurch. Uh, and it's always pleasant to come over here, even on a cloudy day, actually, you can take that dumb short flight over to Hokitika and then um, cruise down to Greymouth um, for events, and I'm over here every now and again. But I'm joined very ably today, and I'll let um, Alice introduce herself, other than her first name now, Alice Bernard. Alice, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, you, I guess, what you're doing at the moment and why you're here in the room today? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm from the Digital Economy team at MB, which is the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. Um, and I am part of a team uh, whose goal is to sort of grow the tech sector in New Zealand and help people and businesses use digital technology um, to improve productivity and enhance quality of life for all New Zealanders. Uh, we've been working on a project looking at how government can support the adoption of digital tools um, and building digital skills for small businesses to increase the productivity of the, these businesses for themselves and for New Zealand as a whole. Um, and for this project, our research tells us that when businesses want um, advice, uh, they usually go to their trusted advisors, um, whether that be industry bodies or their accountant or um, other advisors. Um, and the approach we've taken for this project has been to partner with these advisors in the events that they're running um, for small businesses to see if we can help influence the events uh, to provide better advice around digital tools and skills and drive businesses to make changes rather than just going along to the event and being like, that sounds great, but I don't really know where to start. Um, so that's why we're here with Richard today. We've um, developed a resource that which we call our, our cookbook um, and we're testing the cookbook to see how well it works and whether the information that it contains is useful for people running these events. So um, Richard's used our cookbook planning the session today um, and we'd love to get your feedback about what you think worked well or didn't work so well about this session. Um, so you can feel free to email us on um, digitalnz at mbie.govt.nz. Don't worry about taking that down. We'll, we'll figure out a way of getting yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <Well, laughs> and I kind of, can I just say, um, Alice, um, one of the night, the funny thing is, because look at Alice has got handwritten, is that right? Handwritten yeah. paper. And, you know, Harold, last, yeah, I won't ask you how old you are, but I'm going to guess you're, you've got a whole lot less grey hair than I have. So <laughs> you're younger, and here I am. You know, looking like I'm really technologically, you know, technologically sound and proficient here with this um, Surface Pro, which will probably keep cutting off on me. And you'll, every now and again, you'll see me staring at it. It's because I'm using the facial recognition to unlock it again and try and get my notes. <laughs> but I have learnt, you know, having I haven't been involved in a NetHui before, and I've learnt that this is clearly not about me. Um, or Alice, uh, much as I'm sure you'd like to make it all about Alice, <laughs> that sort of person. Um, it's really about you guys, I think, and you know, getting discussion going um, here amongst all of us. Um, and that was quite different for me because when um, Helen and I and others um, talked uh, briefly, it's Helen from um, Helen Wilson from Development West Coast about the session, and another one we're doing later on. I was still kind of going with that old mantra of oh, it's presentations and it's slides and all that sort of carry on. It's a bit more of a workshop, so I don't want to you know start going off down that tangent. But I do one of the things I would really love for all of you, I guess, in some way, shape, or form, including myself, dare I say it. Uh, to get from this 60 odd minutes that we spend together, even if it was only one thing that you might discover through our conversation and discussion with one another today um, that you didn't already know about the digital world and ideally about a tool or something specific and I'm notwithstanding all the discussion we've just had which was great around connectivity and the challenges of getting online in different ways you know, up and down the coast, um, but certainly discovering something that you didn't realise, you didn't know, you didn't know, uh, that maybe you could go away this afternoon or tomorrow, this evening, whenever, and either download an app onto your phone that might you know, change your life in some small way for the positive, or use something different in your businesses. Now on that, um, just a couple of quick things before we rock into it. We've got uh, Ben over here wearing the TUI from Team TUI, or the TUI team, from Internet New Zealand. So um, if anyone gets out of a hand, including myself, Ben will step in and um, read the Riot Act, well probably in a very nice way, the code of conduct or just remind us where we're at. And the key thing is feel very, very free just to you know, share your opinion, um, you know, jump in at any stage. The one thing Alice and I, as you can imagine, have been um, tasked with and a number of people have told us, so it's very, very important, whilst we're not being amplified in this room, 
Hopefully we won't need it. Um, do hold on to a microphone. We've got a couple to pass around because for anyone who's watching the live stream, this is really important. They simply will not hear anything unless you're somewhere near one of these microphones. So I'm assuming actually this sound is okay as far as the live stream goes. Yeah, look at that. Crystal clear. Great. So as I say, it's all about discovery, I guess. And I had, I wondered about um, leading off uh, with a couple of examples. And I, actually, before I do that, Joe, I know we've got a number of Development West Coast people in the room. We've got Internet New Zealand in the room and others. Who's actually in business here? Has this like it owns or operates or is working in a small business? Fantastic. And who's, um, which is good, so about six or seven. Um, and who then in the room is here, I guess, some of you have put your hands up twice, I suspect, how advising small businesses or working with small businesses, because you're in accounting, is that right, Andrew? Yeah. So, um, so just interesting to know, um, because fundamentally, I guess, this was when Helen had talked about the title, Bricks and Mortar was very much, beyond Bricks and Mortar, was very much about um, businesses. So, and it may well be that between the six or seven of you, you may well be at a very different stage on your digital journey and your digital use. But I thought I'd give a couple of examples of companies uh, that I know of or have worked with in the past, because when I talk about, I guess, digital tools, it means one thing to one thing, uh, one person, something else completely different to another. So, for example, in uh, Christchurch, we have someone here might have heard of him. I think he's actually from the West Coast, Benny the Barber. Anyone heard of Benny or uh, knows who Benny is, Benny the Barber? Andrew, you were nodding your head. Is it just because maybe you want a haircut? I don't know. But <laughs> So um, Benny the Barber is a fantastically um, cool, very kind of hip young guy who was uh, a carpenter, uh, by trade, carpenter and joiner. And um, apparently, as the story goes, as he's told me, um, he was a guy who used to cut the hair of all the other you know, dudes, cool dudes that were in his flat, I think, in Christchurch. And he kind of he got tired of the tools and thought, what else am I going to do? So he bought himself a caravan and he started a wee business um, rocking around the South Island mainly, but also occasionally up into the North Island, going to events. He had this really nicely decked out, very, very cool um, retro caravan with his barber chair and a big PlayStation and TV and a coffee machine and things like that. Um, and was doing basically haircuts at events and those sorts of things, just himself. Now, Benny being entrepreneurial um, wasn't certainly by no means was a digital guy, and still I wouldn't say he, he certainly isn't a digital guy. He's got friends who help him out with websites and other bits and pieces, but is becoming a bit more savvy as far as that goes. Uh, at one point, I can't remember how it all got to yet, had one of the All Blacks, I think it was, at an event um, had their haircut uh, with him, and they happened to have an Instagram account and they took a picture and it got shared like 80 to 90,000 times, some outrageous number of times. Um, they didn't charge for it. I don't think Benny probably understood what a you know, social media influence was at that stage. Either way, his business grew out of sight, you know, very, very rapidly as a result of this one photo um, having cut the hair of an all black. And of course, that's kind of his market, you know, young guys and so it all, you know, fits the brand. The point I was going to make is that so overnight he had this phone ringing off the hook basically and I think for a month or two, he literally was still cutting hair, and he works pretty long hours um, by himself, trying to you know, employing staff, more barbers, because it was just getting so popular. This is a business based in suburban Christchurch post-earthquake, literally behind his parents' bedroom in a caravan parked on their property, um, and going very, very well, but he was always answering the phone. And the thing that changed his life was simply just starting to use an online app, I think it's timely that he uses, but there are others, um, where he didn't need, he simply just had online booking system, very, very simple, incredibly cost effective, I think, you know, to start with maybe about 20 bucks a month or something, but basically saved him, you know, three to four hours a week of literally just answering the phone, you know, which is killing his customer service and his experience because he was having to, you know, put down the, the scissors and the shears and things like that. So a very simple um, thing that he used, which was just online, you know, booking, for goodness sake, um, which prevented him from having to pick up the phone all the time. Um, so simple little things like that. We worked with another company, uh, Lindstrom Food. Foods, uh, who now have, because they changed platform and they went to Shopify, which some of you may have heard about, which is an e-commerce platform, um, away from Wix, which also does e-commerce, but it's a bit more of a DIY kind of, you know, fun, friendly thing. We'll be talking a bit more about that um, a wee bit later on today. Um, but they now can integrate simply because they moved platform, which wasn't an expensive, a little bit time consuming admittedly, to get it all set up, but it wasn't an expensive experience. Um, now they have Post Haste, which does all of their transport and logistics throughout the country. They're a Whole food supplier, so they ship right around New Zealand. And there's no paperwork anymore. There's no putting it in from a set with this system and then manually entry into another system. Post Haste has a plugin that goes directly with Shopify. And likewise with their accounting system now, um, this you could be an MYOB customer and use a little bit of an add-on, but an MYOB customer, but certainly zero. Again, no more manual data entry. And this is, we're talking hours a week. For a small business that only has you know three or four staff, 
expands a little bit come Christmas time, um, was you know literally life changing for these people. And aside from saving all that time, of course, it also meant there were you know there were no mistakes now because as long as the customer was inputting details correctly, everything was just automated and going through and very very seamless. So it improved a whole range of things from a logistics point of view in their business. So those are the sorts of things I guess. I think about when I think about beyond bricks and more and how you might use digital tools and what you do. Again, as I said before, notwithstanding the issues we talked about around connectivity and those sorts of things, kind of have to we can't fix that in this particular session. But I'm really interested to know from you guys. I mean, I've got in personal examples. If there are tools um, in the digital world that you either use now that you you know kind of swear by that have had some massive impact in your business um, and therefore your life, I would hope as a result. Or indeed, if there are questions or challenges you've got at the moment that prevent you from using a tool. Again, maybe we have to park the connectivity side of things, but if there are, if there are, if you're kind of naturally feeling a bit fearful about the digital world, um, if you need, you know, someone to hold your hand or guide you, or you just need to ask some questions, then very happy to um, hear about that as well. So, is anyone out of interest just to lead us off and get you guys involved? So I can be quiet. Andrew, is there something you use out of interest? Digitally, it sounds like your sadly connectivity reasons still quite manual, but um, are there are things you use at the moment in your business. Uh, well, is this going? Yes, yes, yep. it does. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I started off white papering, going into a cloud environment, four years ago, uh, and then I went to a couple of MIAB Connect uh, uh, conferences, and Tim Reeve was talking a bit about vaporware at one stage, uh, but made the splash completely from. Uh, into a hybrid cloud environment because of the amount of processing I'm doing. Uh, last year, I brought 230 West Coast businesses over to a cloud environment with Essentials. Now, they're all on cycles. <laughs> They've got the early adopters and the people are still learning. And uh, people that I still have to throw paper to them because they'll never change. The ones who have fully adopted and started utilising electronic invoicing have noticed uh, their collections going up by 30 days. Uh, they're collaborating with me and using the report functions and the data analytics within the program to enhance their business and, and actually look at pain points or uh, winning points and being able to put resources into winning points or um, look at how to do, to look at those the, those weaknesses and do something about them, but it's in a real time environment, a real time environment. So that they're much more agile to be able to change to what's happening now within their businesses. The greatest threat we have to this is the connectivity. Um, once I get over the two factor authentication, which is the way of the security getting in, but their connectivity dropping out, being able to utilise this within their own businesses, their own clients, their own invoicing systems. Even the CRM factor, there's a little app on my phone, for example, where I'm able to uh, call up uh, any contact that I have and have all their details there and I, I know how much they owe me too. Uh, Anyone so in the room? No? Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it's, right? it's sitting on my phone. Uh, no? So that... <laughs> That's just a little app, uh, MIAB invoices. Um, and then there's to go and I can look at workflow practices within my practice. Uh, I still have a server because I'm, I am in a hybrid cloud environment. Uh, so I've got that. On the business advisory side with the digital business that I'm operating, which is anywhere business network, uh, we sell uh, digital learning systems on an affiliate marketing basis to uh, that are based out of the UK and the US in regards to sales funnels, building websites, social media functionary, and that and such like. And that's working well, being able to reach out from the West Coast and have clients who may be in Kansas City, Missouri, or in Alberta, uh, and being able to c communicate with them. Tools like Zoom. Uh, Zoom's quite good because I can call up uh, uh, web pages and I can record webinars. Out of interest, sorry to yeah. So I do a lot of yeah. different different things. 
Yeah. In fact, actually, Dero Zoom Zoom's one of those things I've discovered recently, which even for our project work, because Alice is based in Wellington, um, I'm in Christchurch you know, majority of the time, and I'm not enjoying you know the hospitality on the coast um, with Alice today. But um, yeah, Zoom, it used to be, of course, once upon a time, Skype was kind of it. Um, that wasn't up until that long ago, but now there are a whole range of players in that um, market. Obviously, Google are there, Facebook are there. Um, you know, various other platforms are there. Zoom has certainly been very good. Out of interest, just from the others who are, I'm just really interested to hear from the businesses in the room, um, it sounds like, Andrew, um, despite obviously the ongoing frustrations around some connectivity, not even so much for yourself, but for the clients that you, you know, be able to offer that service you want to to them. Is there anyone who, I guess, um, of the businesses who are here today who's, I guess, less than digital or really looking to take those tentative first steps or feels less than Andrew, I guess, in terms of what you're doing in the cloud or any other tech? Don't want to put you on the spot necessarily, but um, who's based here in Greymouth or elsewhere on the coast? Else? Out of interest, what sort of, um, what sort of businesses are you in? Because you're professional services, obviously you've got that other tranche now in exporting basically, which is great with the, the learning stuff. Um, anyone in retail? Yeah. Oh. yeah. So tell me a little bit about your tourism business. So what, just can you describe so your business? So we're part of the eyesight network yeah. and we're a privately owned one. Okay. Um, we also have a retail business in town and a tour, scenic tour business and a hotel as well. So out of interest, when you, obviously when you looked at the session, because you could be uh, over in another session about resilience of communities and those sorts of things, is there something specifically that, that kind of intrigues you or, you know, or bothers you or mystifies you about the digital world um, that you were hoping might get answered here or...? Um, not really, like probably just yeah. here more to learn, yeah. Um, yeah, see what other people's thoughts were yeah. um, and where we're going, which for the eyesight side of our business, we've been going more into the um, like online business or like online bookings, yeah. where traditionally they were more phone up and, you know, do a voucher and, you know, so it's, we're slowly, the network's been changing over the last four or five years, so it's just where that's going to develop to from that side of the business. Mm. So out of interest, I mean, I assume that's been a positive thing. Have there been challenges or hiccups along the way as far as, you know, putting in online booking systems and those sorts of things, or? Uh, not from our end, no. Right. No, it's, it's, been quite, it's been great. It's been, it's, everything's quicker. Mm. Good. Helen, did you want to add something there, or? Richard, I just wanted to say that um, the person who actually coined the phrase beyond bricks and mortar was actually Mekwa, who no, is right. part of our steering mm -hmm. committee. And um, and she's not actually here, she's at the other session. But I did want to say that one of the things, uh, one of the reasons she came up with this particular topic, she has um, a mother of, um, who has a family business in our town, um, a very successful little business, but um, she hasn't moved beyond the bricks and mortar of retail. And she is um, my age, I know that Mikva's mother is my age, um, she hasn't got a Facebook page, she hasn't got a web page, she's sort of thinking, gosh, maybe I should, what would I do it for, why would I need it, I've got a shop. Um, it's quite interesting that part of her service is um, floristry, so I can already think that maybe being able to buy online and book online and do things like that would be a crucial part of her operation. But um, one of the things that I think you might want, or maybe Alice could talk about, is the sorts of things that the government, even the IRD, um, you know, the business number, the, you know, even civil defence, I'm a volunteer for civil defence here, and um, we're now doing online training as well, um, and I've got to, I've got to hook in. I've got to suddenly do all that through my real me, and I know I have a real me number somewhere. But do you think I can remember which one of my emails I used? And I'm thinking, can I have two real me's? Excellent, because so I've, I've forgotten the other one, but. But so even civil defence now requires me or has hooked into all of those things about having a real me and I'm not quite yet understanding what that, I know it's important, but what that's doing for me. Well, I tell you what, let's, yeah, yeah and I'm, Alice, you don't mind being put on the spot, do you? I had strict instructions because um, Alice is moving her way around government as an intern at the moment, um, although certainly doesn't, you know, um, so... The MB guy said, oh, you've got to look after Alice, you know, she's you know, this wee fragile flower. No, you're not, <laughs> you know, you can look after yourself. So I'll get to that in a second, but one of the things that might help you, Helen, and maybe others in the room, that I swear by because I've got a rubbish memory, 
Um, and of course, we all have huge numbers of accounts for this, that, and the other online. You know, or, you know, whether depending on what you use, is it personal or professional? So I'd certainly recommend that would help you with your remembering that. If there was one thing to take away from this, um, a password locker of some sort, like a LastPass or OnePass. There are a whole range of different you know, products out there, to be fair. I'm not here to sell one any particular thing, but um, aside from being a whole lot better for your cyber security and your cyber safety, um, that'll certainly help you um, dramatically. I use it constantly on my phone. Um, today, I've probably used it three or four times already since getting up, um, so that might be very useful. But Alice, do you want to just take us through a little bit, because you've actually been around with the Department of Internal Affairs before coming to the MB role at the moment, around some of the e-government stuff and some of what's going on? I don't know a whole heap about those things, but... Um I know with Realme, so there's two stages. You can have a Realme log on to just to log on to things, but then you can also have your Realme um, sort of authorised. And I think you take your passport or ID into a post office, um, and it becomes like authorised, and that that enables you to do sort of more with your Realme and stops you from having multiple Realme accounts rather than having you know you've logged in three times, you've got two separate accounts, and you can't remember which username and which password goes with which. Um, so that's one thing um, and you mentioned NZBN as well um, which is some work which is coming out of MB a different part of MB um, not our part um, but um, but that is also um, something that yeah enables so I think I believe you can f get a business number for your own business um, and you can also follow other businesses business numbers that you work with and your supply chain or your customers um, you know suppliers yeah. those sorts of people yeah um, and that means that you sort of get notified when they make a change to their business, like, um, like you know, if there's someone that, I know foodstuffs do a lot with NZBN, um, and that way if they've got, uh, you know, a supplier with their NZBN who has changed address or location or email, that'll automatically update to their system so that they can keep in touch with, they, they don't lose touch with their of the other businesses It's one of those with. things, and it was it started actually, it was interesting you talking about it, Andrew, before about pain points, because I think research shows, and I can't remember because I wasn't part of the research, um, the exact stats. And there was a government roadshow that you've obviously been to recently that talked about this and a whole range of other sort of online type and other government services um, that basically showed that one of the, the biggest pain points, as we know, to you know, small to medium-sized businesses, larger businesses too, I suspect, but certainly small businesses was cash flow. You know, and the time payments, I think you said, Andrew, obviously with some of your guys that you deal with that are since they started getting a bit more tech savvy and digital, then that you know the cash flow had improved. Yeah, you know, they, they come down. So, one of the issues uh, with cash flow is that for a lot of businesses who are changing email addresses or staff were changing what have you, the thing about the New Zealand business number was it was on one point, and if that was kept up to date, and if you were linked into that somehow, it didn't matter what was changing with your supplier. Um, at one end, you would always still have the right information. So um, you wouldn't have invoices going to inboxes that no one was looking at anymore or just kind of going off into the ether and never being paid or having to chase. So it was a better way of, um, I guess, keeping connected in the right way with people. It was kind of fundamental. So I was trying to address uh, the pain point of cash flow, I suppose, and not getting paid as quickly as we would like for small businesses. So I'm not sure where the adoption's up on that, but um, certainly that's there to be used. And I was in a meeting actually with MOB yesterday, as it turns out, uh, talking about those sorts of things as well, because um, things like e-invoicing, has anyone heard of e-invoicing? Um, the other businesses, you guys heard of e-invoicing at all? So it just basically means, and again, Andrew, you probably know more than I here, so jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but again, as, aside from actually waiting at all, uh, it means everyone's kind of linked uh, to a point through your Xero or your MYB or other accounting software package. You have to be on one of those. That's one of the things you have to be in the digital world to take advantage of this. Um, whereby I think, Andrew, if, I, if my company um, is, I send an invoice effectively to you, well, I don't really, there's no hands on it, basically, it goes from my accounting software to your accounting software, and almost payment happens automatically, is that right? Mm. Oh, sorry. There's an API between the two, so I could be operating Sage and uh, send it to the e-invoicing people, and uh, you would receive it in zero. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you would authorise it and get paid. So it's an API or application program yep. uh, interface between the two, but it just needs that, that verification. And that is, uh, we have um, one fraud that I know of whereby in the email they grab the PDF, change the bank account on the PDF invoice, 
to another client, another person's bank account. They paid, the money was sent by Western Union into Bitcoin in the India, uh, and three hundred and fifty thousand dollars lost from their bank account. Now that was could be local. Okay, so it's happened. Uh, e invoicing, on the other hand, uh, is similar to blockchain. It's it's more secure. I think just on that, picking up a point you made actually earlier on, Patrick, when someone asked you about uh, security of the IoT network, um, I thought you said it quite well. Where it wasn't so much a matter of um, I can't remember your exact words, you know. Um, if or when necessarily now, but certainly people had to be prepared because that's one of those challenges, I guess, with moving into the digital world and using more of these tools. There's potential for risk from a cybersecurity point of view, but it's about you know managing that. We can talk about that too if that's something of interest. It was just what I was going to lead into, Richard, and I was after your thoughts on that. Um, some of the businesses that I have met with, and we've talked about cloud-based software. And there's still that perception or that scare of um, security, you know. Um, and I know it's come a long way, but, um, you know, I've even got a business that has set up their own server on a PC under their desk because they were trying to avoid the cloud-based software. So what are your thoughts on that? And how do we, how do we encourage businesses that it's not, you know, as dangerous as they may think it is. Yeah, well, it's, it's out of interest, um, just a show of hands quickly as part of the answering to that question. Um, for the organisations you work at, whether it's your business or you work in a larger organisation, who here knows if there's um, offline backup or storage of any kind? You, if you're using it, you're putting your hand up. Yeah, and you may not, to be fair, if it's a larger organisation, you may not know. Um, who here, I'm sorry? Yeah, or at home, that's right. Sorry, that was um, yeah, Patrick from Spark at home, he said. <laughs> um, but I was going to say, the cloud, generally speaking, and I am by no means, there'll be people in this room, I'm sure, who have got more technical expertise than me, but generally speaking, the cloud is safer than the server under the desk. It's more secure. Um, it has, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's not just about security. Of course, it's about being able to access your data anywhere and do a whole range of things, I guess, and use things um, in the cloud that you can't use, you know, when you used to put the old, you know, disk into your machine and load up the software and those sorts of things. Um, there's still an issue, one of the, one of the things that I learned um, a little while back doing some cybersecurity stuff is that if you've got people here might be using Google Drive, OneDrive, Apple Drive, though, iDrive, I should say, um, and I certainly use a range of those products and what I do for work and personal use. Um, but if you've got files on your laptop or your desktop machine that are syncing to the cloud, they are susceptible. So if you had, you know, some, somehow someone managed to get malware onto your computer, um, they can be locked down as well. So just if it's syncing, it's effectively still, you know, on your local machine, it can be, you know, um, taken advantage of. Um, any things you have in the cloud, generally speaking, unless someone breaks into a Google data center or something somewhere which is... You know, the Titanic obviously sunk. Uh, very unlikely, <laughs> I guess is how I would say. Very, very unlikely. And certainly um, they're much more likely to get in and steal the server under your desk than they are to get into a Google data center. So it's infinitely more secure than any localized security system. The other nice thing is that um, these days there are some really good free products uh, that businesses and people can use. Um, you know, that are you know, very easy to install. You don't need to be a technical wizard about the stuff. And even just basic fundamentals like having you know backup could just be on a you know USB stick or a drive depending on what you need that's actually you know unplugged from your machine not on the network is there a question from online no but you've got to add great ah uh, thank you yeah does everyone well actually I'm just going to explain it anyway because <coughs> I need to know <laughs> so malware is it comes in all sorts of different forms but uh, mal for malicious we're for software so malware um, so I was you know, deciding a name for their business at some point. Um, so malware. So yeah, it's basically just software you don't want, basically. And you may not know, there may be, I'm sure, a number of us uh, in the room at the moment who possibly have it on their machine. You wouldn't know. It doesn't necessarily, if it's on your machine, it may not necessarily be used to attack you or do something to your business, but someone might be taking one of your connected devices, you know, if it's insecure or what have you, and using it to attack someone else. Or, yeah. You could go on for ages about the different types of attack and things, but no, malware is malicious software. I think you'd probably expect, yeah. Any other, out of interest, any questions or thoughts? Has anyone here, just while we're on that cybersecurity topic, has anyone here um, ever have, you know, been part of a, not run a scam, but obviously been um, impacted by a scam or cybersecurity breach or incident or data theft at all? 
Don's, I certainly have. There's a site, there's a website, um, and you may know off the top of my head, I usually have slides in front of me, but um, have I been pawned? Yeah, have I been pawned, which is P W N E D? Yeah. So if you want to take a note of that, I'm not sure if we can get. Um, but have I been pawned is great because if you put in your um, email addresses, um, you might put in your work one, you might put in your Gmail or your Outlook or your Hotmail or whatever it may be, but you can very quickly see if your if that particular email address has been compromised in any big data breach that's happened around the world. So you know, there are some pretty prominent ones like at LinkedIn, um, you know, Twitter, um, Facebook obviously had some issues uh, more recently as well. Um, only three billion. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. 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 That's great. Okay. Well, let's take that. Yeah, we can take that offline, or at least put it online at a um, at a different stage. Do you want to do you want to do that again? <laughs> <laughs> you had the microphone. Yeah. We got that right. Sure. Okay. I'll do it again, <laughs> and I'll just say um, we're doing a session this afternoon on cybersecurity, so we can cover all of that stuff off as well. Yeah. Then. And that's, I guess, leading back to my comments, and then I'll leave it there with that, uh, you know, with LastPass, OnePass, all those password lockers is a, is a great part and a very quick, easy, free, for the most part, you know, way to make sure you're that much more protected, which is great, yeah. So from, sorry, jump in, Helen. Do you want to give you a microphone? Just a question, um, just a random thing, but uh, getting back to business and what businesses use and need and things like that. What about Facebook for business? I heard there were changes or some businesses were having difficulty or Facebook changed the way it did things so it wasn't so great to have a Facebook page or so easy to have a Facebook page or... It's still worth... Yeah, no, jump in, Aaron. Have you got something to add to that? Just quickly. Maybe we could just talk at work, Aaron, or... Oh, no, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> we could talk at work. But then you'd miss the great session we have at 3 o'clock today about <laughs> boosting our region using Facebook. So... In that, not me, but everyone, and Steve will be zooming in using the technology. So talking about, so yes, there has been some changes on Facebook. So it has been harder for some people, but there are some hacks. So come at three o'clock and you'll find out. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, because there's a, obviously a specifically, you know, um, session um, on social media. The one thing, no matter what you hear today from Facebook, and they'll tell you as it is right now, um, tomorrow it could change. The same with Google, not just Facebook. Any any operator, quite frankly, can change their product and their software. Patrick, do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, I just um, maybe jumping around a little bit on topics, but going a little bit back to what you're talking about about around e-invoicing. Um, and more businesses transacting through these cloud platforms and so forth. I think one of the one of the benefits or insights that we'll get from that that's that's probably growing is that we'll actually start to understand, um, as long as we use the data appropriately, understand what real business confidence actually is. We're going to be able to know mm. whether people are really paying the bills on time or not. Are they delaying? Why are they delaying? Which sectors? Which regions? Um, which uh, any other aspects of business are, are, are doing things in one way or another. And so we're going to be a lot less dependent on um, sort of anecdotal mm. uh, or sort of unquantifiable evidence of whether th things are going well or badly in business. And I think that's that's an incredibly interesting um, uh, opportunity to, to use that data. Absolutely. Uh, just a word about data. Uh, there are a lot of millionaires out there who don't pay to the 90-day column anyway. Uh, so uh, business confidence, I mean, there are some people out there who just don't pay. Uh, but uh, so, I'll, uh, yeah, yeah, so never, ever rely on that. So just on that, um, just with the other um, businesses who are in the room, uh, in terms of, you know, the amount of time it takes to get payment, you know, from a creditor, is that a challenge at times? I it is, I think, at some stage for every business, but is that something you guys feel? Is that, you know, a real pressure point for you? And so out of interest, uh, would you have an idea at the moment on what that kind of average is? you having to chase most people or just some people? Um, I probably couldn't exactly give you, like, a percentage yeah. or anything without looking into it a bit further, but, yeah, definitely um, we have debtors in the 90-day plus column yeah. <laughs> that we're phoning and saying, hey, where's the payment? Um, and have our accounts person chasing them up. So, yeah, 
Um, but we have quite a yeah, large um, a system for um, advertising and stuff like that. So yeah. Mm. And just what other systems do you use? So I mean, thinking about um, logistics, even staff. Do you use any digital tools for managing HR and payroll and those sorts of things? We're on MYB, so okay. MYB retail uh, manager and payroll. Okay, great. And what about the rest of your business? As far as sorry, Ben, you'll get the microphone back <laughs> at some point. I'm just interested to you know, hear a bit more from the businesses. So uh, in terms of the across, I guess just operations, are there other things that you've started using over the last year or two that have proved to be quite useful? You on those like three six five, or do you use Google Docs or any th any other cloud based tools? Uh, no, not yeah. really. Just what I normally use. Yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't really looked into any of that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm just going to pass over to Victoria, but first I just thought I'd chip in. So, my wife is a self employed portrait photographer, and recently, like so, over the last few years, because she's married to me, I kind of prod her to get more cloud and and do more things online. And probably the biggest time save for her is the online booking. Mm. It's the so you know photography. You pay for their time, and then you pay for the photos, and so you're actually having to chase customers twice for money. Every she used to, and now it's just the booking comes in, the PayPal notification comes in. It's linked to a calendar. You can't double book. You know exactly when things are happening. You don't have to talk to people on the phone. And people are getting used to that too. I think there's a there's a move. I remember with Lindstrom Foods because uh, we gave them some advice initially uh, when they were looking. There's no one. They don't employ an IT manager or they don't have a coder there on site to you know to fix things. So Shopify is great because like many. Um, platforms like that, there are templates and themes and things you can either buy or get for free. But inevitably people want to tweak something or they want to change something ever so slightly and that requires a bit of technical skill that most people don't have. Um, but there was a system uh, that I found when we were helping them out called Hey Carson. So I think it's a Canadian based company but frankly it could be anywhere in the world. It could be you know Christchurch, I don't know. Um, but they certainly touted themselves as Canadian based. Maybe it was a marketing ploy by someone in America. I don't know. Um, but at the very least, um, it was literally pay before, so it was IT consultancy, so coders who specialised in just tweaking, doing little changes to Shopify sites, for example, and I, th I can't remember, it was like $60 US or something per hour um, for small jobs, and we needed to get the fonts. The designer had picked fonts that Shopify didn't automatically have, so we had to pay to get these installed and the theme, and it was certainly beyond our capability. Um, but it was the case, just like your wife, thinking about her photography, getting payment in advance, where... I paid for this IT, you know, service. Did it all on, all completely online. Never went and saw anyone. Completely online, and it worked superbly. And less than 24 hours later, I had really professional service. It followed up. The billing was done. I'd paid them. They weren't having to chase me for money, and we had the fonts installed that we weren't able to do on Shopify. Um, now I don't know if any uh, if many firms could get away with that just yet in New Zealand, because too many firms are saying, "Hey, we'll invoice you," um, but over time that simply will change, um, and people will get into the mode of saying, "Oh, maybe I just." Yeah, there may be a way of trust up front and paying for a consultant services before you get some or part of them perhaps. Yeah. So sorry, jump in. No worries. I'm just going back to kind of what you were saying, Helen, about the florist. I'm really interested in the kind of the motivations or, or the barriers for people who want to go online or, or maybe they really actually should or could really benefit from it, but what's kind of stopping them? So I don't know, perhaps that's something that you could reflect on as well, Alice, with um, the work Certainly in the project, yeah. MB's been doing about, you know, skills, you know, the motivations to get, say, businesses going online or, or what's stopping them, so that I don't know if who wants to respond to that one. I won't respond, but I will say that I think um, for Mikko's mum, um, time, um, it's just a whole different field there where there is a perception that she needs to find somebody to build a website and that's going to be difficult and she doesn't or you know that's going to be expensive and if I have a Facebook page do I have to be on it every day do I have to post how do I boost it what do I but you know what's the point what's the difference between web so there are still people yes. that are actually in business um, and doing quite well um, and it's not just an age thing, but there is there is perceived barriers as well. So, yes, there's help out there for them. They need to know that, I guess. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I wonder too, it'll be interesting to hear what you have to say, but um, because for a lot of industries, yes, things have changed, but there's still not an absolute, you know, kick up the backside or something to really, you know, until someone almost starts to lose money, perhaps I wonder if it's until it's hit someone in the back pocket or businesses are going down to the florist down the road because they have got online ordering and they can, you know, do e-commerce or what have you, 
then that might be the final thing. But often, um, you know, zero MYB and those sorts of people are a good case. Um, often, you don't necessarily have to be the first mover, but you want to be quite early on, I guess, and taking up, you know, trialing something new and doing something new. And often the perception is it's aside from time, which can still be there, to be fair, I think, in a lot of cases. Um, but even cost. But things are, that's the, the really neat thing. I don't know, uh, Ben, you know, from an Internet New Zealand perspective, you know, the democracy of the internet, you know, things are becoming heck of a lot more affordable for businesses. There are a lot more options out there than there used to be. Um, and products are being designed better, tools and applications and things, so they should be more intuitive in terms of having to set them up and trying to figure out how to integrate things. That stuff is just becoming, and it's not because I've done it lots, I'm not a digital native. I didn't grow up with a, you know, a tablet in my hand. I simply didn't. You know, I had to learn like everyone else. Um, I have lucky at times to have a bit of time, but um, it's certainly much more doable than it ever was before. And let's hope that's the way it continues to be. So jump in. I, I was just going to say, I think as well, some of the time it's... Um, what we're hearing is that sometimes businesses don't know what they don't know. So they know their business and they know how to run their business the way they've been running it, but they might not necessarily know what's available to them um, and that it might not be as cost prohibitive as they might have assumed. So sometimes um, what we're finding is really helpful in this project is linking small businesses with each other um, so that they have a network of, of other, you know, to find out from other people's experience and what other businesses have done and they can do similar things. And obviously... Sometimes they're comp competing with each other, so they might not want to share um, <laughs> share their advantage. But um, but those network building networks can be really um, helpful. So. Uh, hello, I have a retail business that is not online. <laughs> it's a confession. <laughs> um, the main reason is is that I'm hands on. Uh, it's also a service business. Um, and I have been floating around, making myself known that I want help. Uh, it was even on um, Boost Your Town, um, admitting that I'm not online, <laughs> um, and that I would like help. But actually, I just found everyone just walk away. Um, if you're not educated on the internet, people really don't want to know about you. Um, and as a small business, I'm looking, but are finding that there is no help because it's a great big invisible world and every time I tap into it, after about half an hour I'm over it. <laughs> um, mainly because there is no direction inside it. No one's actually saying, go this way, take this path, you'll get your first five steps and then you'll be on your way. So people, <laughs> we need help because there is no one guiding us. Yeah, just to put a, a, a um, I guess a shameless plug for Digital Journey in here, um, one of the things you could, <laughs> that's really what I'm here for people, that and the big muffins I had at morning tea, they were great, yeah. Um, I hope they'll be out again at lunchtime. One of the things I guess, because you're right, and uh, one of the challenges we have is I guess scalability, because there certainly are you know, people like us who would love to help. Um, you know, as a social enterprise, want to do it in a way that's effective and affordable and all the rest of it, you know. Uh, we're not here to build big office blocks and various things as consultants or anything like that. But we have a, there's an online tool that you could use, a free online tool, that at least might help you to prioritise exactly what those first steps might be. Now it's, um, obviously you make contact with us, but it might also then mean that when you make contact with perhaps local providers, whether it be for, you know, say someone to help you with a website or anything else I guess in the digital world at least you'll you'll know what you need to be asking I guess so um, digital journeys uh, assessment tool if you just go to digitaljourney.org um, and then you'll see very quickly bang right there on our home page a link to the free digital business assessment or business digital assessment um, and it basically is just a 10 minute free assessment it'll take you through all the different facets this is for any of you guys all the different facets of your business so we're talking operations logistics staff you know um, websites social media all that sort of stuff um, and give you a customized action plan at the end of it with links to free resources and other things because it's like a business plan I guess effectively where it's generally for whatever reason it's really good when it's written down well this will write it down for you being cloud-based, you can log in from anywhere and see it and kind of remind yourself, okay, well, that was the, it kind of prioritizes things for you. So they might say, well, this is, I don't know what it might say in your case, but it might be, you know, it might be, you know, look at a website. It won't say, start saying, look at social media first off. It'll look at, yeah, it'll prioritize things for you. So it'll make it in bite-sized pieces. So hopefully at the very least as a start, that should be very useful. Helen, I don't know, in terms of uh, local support, even Aaron, you may have a feel for this. Um, 
on the coast for any, someone like this in business, what would be your comments? Um, so Vanessa's from Westport. So I don't know. I'd hop pop into Epic Westport, talk to Tash. I mean, she's the great connector. She'll be able to point you into the right direction. Have you already been there? <laughs> to a <laughs> direction? Yeah. Yeah, or West Coast Rewards, Rochelle? Yeah, I'm running a MYOB Essentials course up there uh, next month. Uh, I ran one in France and one in, uh, in Greymouth here, and they're all free. Uh, so that's a, a morning, uh, well, you know, an hour, an hour and a half. So that might get you into the digital accounting side. And I'm, I'm always there uh, to yak to later on. Uh, so that's always available, uh, and that gets you into the cloud environment. The other thing is, is <laughs> these things, the weird and wonderful area of Facebook, you can have things people call virtual assistants in the Philippines who work for peanuts, and they'll do all your social media for you, for nothing. <laughs> uh, so there's those sorts of people as well. And then there's specialist assistants on Fiverr.com. So for example, you want logos done, digitised, you can get someone in Bangladesh to do it for you for 20 bucks that would cost you at James Print four or five hundred. Uh, so just keep in the mind that the, the world out there is full of opportunities for people in poor countries. It's a trick, I guess, is, um, well, it's that, but it's also the nice thing is that Fiverr uh, doesn't discriminate from what I understand against people who live in Westport or Greymouth. You'll find that even on those big um, networks, because Fiverr's one, Freelancer is another, depending on, there's lots of sort of networks like that or sites we can go to to get expertise if you can't find someone local. I think wouldn't we all love, obviously, if we could always find it locally and just down the road, that would be awesome if we could do that. But chances are those guys, as you talk about, you know, who might want to manage your social media or design your website, they should, if they're being savvy and they're understanding they're in a, they really are in a bit of a global marketplace at the moment, um, then they will also be listed on Fiverr. You may well yet find someone down the road in Greymouth who you find on Fiverr.com or Freelancer.com, something along those lines. Um, cause they, and they also have the chance of winning work out of Bangladesh if they wanted to. They compete with those people because the cloud and the internet um, and all that connectivity makes that possible now. So that's the cool thing that who knows, may become a bit of a revitalization for places like the coast, you know, in times to come, because assuming you can get the connectivity right, um, there's no reason for those people selling services, even as you've shown, uh, right here, um, can't be connecting now with the rest of the world and selling those services and that expertise, that creativity, what it is they've got under the hood, um, and making money and, you know, earning, becoming, you know, service exporters, basically. Absolutely nothing to stop you. Out of interest, do you, do you um, make products or do you bring in products and then sell them in retail or do you have stuff that's locally to be produced? So I'm a tailor. Um, I design clothing and I import clothing um, but I also resource locally and believe in um, recycling So and using what we've got. But I guess the point I would make is that um, because you're actually a creator, not just a reseller, I guess, you know, someone who imports then you know, it's all that's part of your business, um, but inevitably I assume through what you do there'll be some very unique thing that only you do or an angle on it or a creativity uh, <laughs> that you probably have that may well have a market you know, well beyond the coast. And so that's the beauty, I guess, of going online and using digital tools and I guess going beyond bricks and mortar. And that's not for everybody, of course, um, you know, uh, but because you've got that, you're actually a creator, you know, you're manufacturing. Um, then that's the lovely thing that opens up. Aside from actually just letting more people around the coast know, it may seem like everybody knows everybody and what's going on, but uh, yeah, maybe to a point, but yeah, not everything. So there will be people who have yet to discover you or you know, yet to find out who you are who will do that more readily because you go online. But as uh, it becomes instantly, you can go as far afield to Christchurch, you sell your product, you can go overseas, you know? So it just opens up the world um, in such a big way. Yeah, I'm actually ready to open up. <laughs> but no one's going to um, help you from the sounds no, of things, are yeah. No, but I'm not giving up. I just keep wandering around until I find the right people and then well, I want the right yeah. team. Well, let's have a chat afterwards anyway because if I can connect with people or if it's us in the, in the first instance, um, we're, we as an organisation, the social enterprise, are not here to ideally do things for people. Yeah, here and there we, we do bits and pieces, but we would ideally like to build your confidence and your capability to do a lot more for yourself, I guess if that's what you want to spend time and you know, effort doing. Yeah. And that is something that I have been finding. Um, 
I am a doer. I will get off my chair and make <laughs> action happen. Um, but because I am a doer, I'm often overlooked because she'll be right. She's she's getting on with it. That girl's good. Yeah. But um, I have bigger dreams. But uh, yeah, often just need to really reach out and make sure that I am being heard. Yeah. Very good. Well, so let's connect. And I'm interested, just I'll take the microphone because I would love to hear, and I know it's kind of putting people on the spot. Does anyone want to talk about, anyone else have the same sorts of things from a business perspective, the same issues in terms of just knowing who to go to or not being able to actually get the support to get online and go a little bit more digital? You haven't had too much of a problem? I'm interested you have local suppliers and things? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you've done it all yourself. Great. Um, no, I haven't had a problem. Um, the only thing I haven't done is the tour business. I haven't got social media sorted, but that's on my plan this month <laughs> for summer. Um, but all our businesses have social media platforms, and the gift shop itself, ha we actually, um, and probably need to do it more, but we actually, you can put product on the Facebook shop site um, so and sell product online via the Facebook site as well. So it's got all those sorts of things there for you to tap into. Um, yeah, so including with the tour business from our website, we're, we're going to build a new website for the tour business, but at the moment it's just on our iSite website, and we just linked a booking system to it, um, and just put all the tours on that so people can book online, so um, yeah, but it's just from, I don't know, I suppose going to different workshops and just talking to other people and finding out, and then yeah. Making contact, yeah, which you're trying with, to do. With that in mind, just quickly before <laughs> I pass the mic on, I mean, because that's one of the things, and Alice kind of mentioned it before around the MB project, and this isn't a very localised version, obviously, but even if there were connections, um, you know, between you two, you know, as, yeah. you know, as business people, as, you know... I'm sitting here going, oh, I can help you with that. Community, <laughs> give or take. That's, that's easy. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. I mean, because that's probably useful in itself, but because then all of a sudden there's a connection. I mean, that's often how it works. Like, uh, but that's what social media is, I guess, kind of like, because instead of maybe connecting face-to-face, -face, but you might, oh, well, do you know someone, or could you recommend, or was it a pain to do this, or how much did it cost? Those sorts of things can be very yeah. useful, just talking to other businesses. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, the other things, it, it, it helps to break things down into steps. The first step might be just to have a Facebook site with some photos of your product, getting some friends, getting some likes, getting some people interested in your product. The next step might be the Wix site that uh, we're talking about over here. Uh, and, and then before you, you, you know it, you might be going on to Shopify, but all this takes time. Don't take all the bites of the cherries and jump off the cliff all at once. Just take little bites, because then you can continue in business, make money, rather than drop everything for six months and, and white paper everything and end up going bankrupt or worse because you aren't devoting time to your business. Because remember, you are a creative person, you're a brilliant creative person, and that's not your expertise. Do it slowly. That's fine. I'll just test that just for a moment. Sorry. Um, just really quickly um, while they're testing that. Um, one little example of that with my team is my team and I as not finance people and not great technical people, we're, we're pretty crappy at accounts. Um, and so I actually use, we use a product called Receipt Bank that just lets me take a photo of all my receipts they just down, I, I'm using the most basic version of it right now. It stores them at the end of the month when I get my credit card bill. I just print them out as A4 images of everything and code them up. Next step, once they're comfortable with that, I'm going to load my chart of accounts into this tool so they can code them in there. And then the next step is the zero integration because my finance team has zero so I can just, no one has to print anything. The nice thing is, depending on where you're at, because... Well, no, no, we're, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're just, we're with zero. That's, yeah, that's but I was for both, yeah. Was. yeah. In fact, today, because I've already got a receipt today that I'll use um, uh, zero for, but you see, the MOB does the same thing, a number yeah, of those products, they've all got onto it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's all these APIs that are common to both zero and MYOB that can make business life incredible. But if you haven't, you aren't on zero or MYOB, 
we have to start that conversation first to, 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 to get you wear a position where you start saving time and energy. And then you can start getting information for decision making. But you just have to get to that point first. So the first step is to recognise that you have a problem. My name is Andrew. <laughs> uh, Richard, I just wanted to check in. Six minutes left. Yes. So a few people have, there are five minutes left. <laughs> Few people have been pretty quiet. Does anyone else have anything they want to throw in or any questions before we run out of time? No other thoughts or any from the, certainly from the business people at least in the room. Uh, any concerns or questions you've got? Don't want to preempt Nestle's social media or cyber security. But I was yes, just wondering if everybody knows what an API is. I've heard it you know, thrown around a few times today. Um, when it comes to business, you know, not everyone is an IT person. I'm a network and systems administrator back in Christchurch yep. and do this part time as well. Um, and they are quite complex and they're not always, you know, seamless. Um, I'm just wondering if that is something yeah. that everyone's familiar with. So basically, it, think of it as a, a plug in. You're trying to plug two bits of software together and trying to get two different systems to integrate nicely across a single pane of glass. That's basically what it's trying to do. So you've got your, I'm not so familiar with MYOB or, or accounting. Um, we mainly deal with schools and things like that, so you know, we don't, don't do too much of that stuff. But um, when it comes down to it, it's just so you've got your accounting software and then there's other, you know, you can have ap applications on your cell phone. Um, what are some other examples of, of APIs that you're using? Right. Tanda, your yep. employees just scan their fingerprint and that's their timesheet. Sure. Automatically interfaces with the MIOB payroll. Yeah, so it sounds like it's a, a third party piece of software and possibly hardware if they've got their fingerprint on that. And then that software, often the API is cloud based as well, so they'll log in there. That will go off to their services and then there's an API that links them in the cloud from there over to your MYOB. I tell you what, um, now just on there, as someone who is obviously very keen, is great that's all you need is enthusiasm basically that's it some chats but basic so when we talk about apis the fundamental thing is you don't need to know what an api is you simply as a business owner who's you know looking to get online in some way shape or form use the cloud and just slowly you know, i think andrew's quite right you know it's one bit at a time and that's why that prioritizer list that digital journey tool can be useful because it you know checks it out for you what's prioritizes things for you depending on how you answer questions um, you're honest to God. I mean, I uh, you know I, I couldn't even tell you right now, coming from digitally, what API stands for. You'll probably know what the acronym is. Automated Programmable something. Programmable yeah. interface. You, frankly, you don't need to know. So don't don't let. Sometimes and you're quite right. It was still a good thing to say. Well, what does an API do? You, unless you're a programmer, you I don't need to know. I can fiddle around with websites. Like you simply do not need to know. Um, it's something. It's a whole other. You know, it's into the next kind of level of technical sphere that you, you don't need to be across. So don't be worried about that. Um, fundamentally, it's become all you need to know is that it has become much easier. And there are absolutely us and other organisations, even you know people in the accounting field like Andrew, I guess, who you know are willing to say, "Oh, well, let's start here and just give you some guidance." And then, literally, some of these products are, are very good, and you will be able to. And they're pretty intuitive, and you'll be able to just kind of get going yourself. And of course, by doing that, you'll simply grow a bit of confidence. You'll start to, you know, you'll think about something else, and you'll just try things. Yeah. Jump in. Yeah, Finally, um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, so it seems to me that one of the things I might want to consider is actually being able to contemplate the end product or the end service, so that if I'm considering all of these other things like APAs and add-ons, that as much as possible, I'm thinking ahead in terms of the things I want to utilise it. So I'm looking at systems that will integrate as seamlessly as possible rather than getting to a certain point and going, oh, wait a minute, there's no application that actually marries yeah. this system to that. It's one of those, I suppose, going back to that Lindstrom Foods example, and it, um, so Shopify, for example, as a platform, you know, as someone, like you could easily go into Shopify, you could, you know, um, very inexpensively, very quickly, um, just simply start setting up a Shopify site. Um, now, Shopify was handy for Lindstrom Foods because they knew they wanted to integrate with their accounting system, and Post Haste just happened to be their logistics transport provider of choice at the time, it still is, um, and it just randomly happened that they had this integration, so they would literally, and they didn't have to know APIs, they didn't have to know codes, Post Haste talked them through it, um, effectively, it's kind of just think of it as like an app that works. That plugs into Shopify. You set up your account, and it all just talks to one another. You do not need to be, you know, technical. You do not need to be a coder or a programmer. Um, but they might have gone to Squared Space that didn't have that integration. So that lends to your point. When you're looking at those sorts of things, sometimes it pays to 
I guess, look beyond maybe that initial use and think, well, you know, um, what else is going to integrate with this? Will Xero work with it? Will MYOB work with it? If it's like an e-commerce platform, because they're not e-commerce platforms in themselves, might be a point of sale, for example. You might have a point of sale system at the moment that has some form of, you know, if you're on Vend or other things like that, that works. So that might lead you down where you might go from a website perspective. Um, so yes, from an integrator, it certainly pays to think about all the different things you might do. But again, just start. <laughs> you know, one thing, just simply having a basic website or even just starting on a Facebook page. You don't have to have a website necessarily. Facebook page alone, um, which you can sell through. And just simply getting people to understand you exist. That's fundamentally what it's about before you even sell product. Just getting to discover you, you know, being discovered. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions or thoughts in closing? Yeah, Alice. I just had one more quick thing that I wanted to say, which was just uh, feel free to come and talk to Richard and I after this. Um, we'll be around until sort of mid-afternoon. Um, if you had any feedback about how the session ran, or yes, there is an email address you can contact us on, um, which we'll figure out a way of getting through. It's in the notes. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. And thanks for everyone watching on the live stream, I suppose. We'll see you back soon.